Gentlemen, welcome back uh, for our afternoon group of sessions. I hope you've had a decent lunch, I hope you've had a decent chance to check your emails and make all of those essential work calls. A um, quick reminder to switch your phones back onto silent, otherwise we'll find out who's got the crazy frog ring time still after all these years. Um, so this morning I guess we've touched across the, 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 the policy landscape and we've touched across the uh, provider change landscape. Um, and so this afternoon, I think we're starting with a discussion on specific issues of cost effectiveness and routes to market. Um, cost effectiveness clearly being the, uh, the new language of a, of a system under sustained financial pressure. Um, and I'm delighted to be joined by, by three experts. We've got uh, James Raftery, the Professor of Health Technology Assessment of the University of Southampton. Uh, Janet Robertson, who's the Associate Director for Technology Appraisals at NICE. And Dr. David Parkin, Professor of Health Economics at King's oh. College London. Um, as this morning, I think we're going to have just a, a, a few opening remarks, really, from each of our panellists um, to allow the maximum of time for, for discussion and input from, from you all. Now, my colleagues with the roving microphones were, um, were, were, frankly, looking around for you to be signalling like creatures in auction rooms, and I think that didn't, that didn't quite work. So, so, so we could impose um, the microphone onto tables uh, to, to, to ensure a lively and full discussion, and you get full value for your money uh, this afternoon. Um, if you'd like to avoid that eventuality, then please just stick your hand up nice and prominently so my colleagues can see them and we'll bring you into the conversation as soon as we can. So, um, Dave, can I ask you to, to, to kick off with three minutes or thereabouts of thoughts on cost effectiveness, routes to market and what the modernised, fragmented, liberated NHS and social care system means for the, the people here whose jobs are to sell the NHS things. Right. Well, I, um, yeah, just just a three minutes. The um, uh, the uh, I, I was actually um, this session I thought was about nice. Okay, so that's 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 really what I've uh, organised my uh, thoughts thoughts around. And um, nice has been. Uh, I, I'm a big supporter of nice, and I think nice has been extremely um, good in the way that it's developed, and it's reached a sort of maturity in the way that it um, has has its processes. <coughs> So that I think that as far as uh, being clear about what NICE means um, by cost effectiveness, the way that its proposals are carried out, and all of those process things uh, that are to do with NICE, I think it's, uh, it's very clear, and as I say, it's, it's now a, 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 a mature organisation for doing that. But there are a couple of um, uh, things which, which kind of go against that in the sense that the more mature uh, an organisation, the more clear it is on certain things, the, uh, the more it is um, easy to, uh, for people to kind of uh, second guess again when it was a little bit more, when NICE was a little bit more uh, uh, unclear about what it was doing, um, then it could get away with all sorts of things which I don't think that it can now. And it's always had this problem of regulatory capture. That is to say that uh, all the people from industry, obviously what they want, uh, is going to be for NICE to endorse its products. And not only that, but to enforce uh, sales um, within the NHS, which is a good thing if it's uh, dealing with the issue of whether there's a postcode lottery. But not so good if you think of NICE as being uh, a body which is set up to and deal with cost effectiveness. So I think NICE might be uh, challenged by that, and it'd be interesting to, to know how the uh, in industry um, uh, is, is going to avoid wrecking its, its case uh, by, by doing too much of that regulatory capture. The only other point um, that I want to make, just as a, uh, as a starter, is to think about this issue that I was saying about uh, how transparent it is, um, the, the processes by which uh, NICE uh, uh, carries out its activities in assessing cost effectiveness. It's very good. I mean, if you go on the website, it's all very, very clear about what has to be done in terms of, uh, uh, of economics methods and, and so on. The one thing where it's not quite so transparent, um, not deliberately, um, well, at least I don't know if it's deliberate or not, um, is in terms of its decision making criteria. 
which um, are uh, officially published, but which are really uh, don't, don't amount to anything that's, uh, I think, um, very effective in terms of what NICE actually does. So the book's published idea of what a, a threshold uh, is uh, bears no relation to how it really uh, takes its, uh, its decisions. So there's an interesting uh, element there, it's a transparency one. How transparent should it be and how much uh, is to left to judgment? And again, it's for the uh, industry either to uh, exploit or support NICE uh, in, uh, in dealing with those kind of issues. Okay, I think that's... Uh, Thank you very much, Dave. Yeah. Yeah. Jan. Well, I'm actually from NICE. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 don't, I don't know how much I, I can assume that, that you know about NICE as an organisation, I guess. Um, I, can, I can assume you know um, who we are, and that as an organisation we've grown a great deal over the years. So uh, when I started at, at NICE, which is some considerable time ago, we were technology appraisals um, with the occasional clinical guideline, but because they came, took so long to, to produce, they were very, very occasional. Um, now, of course, NICE does all sorts of things. It's a much bigger organisation. Um, we have lots more programmes. We, we now do so, um, social care and, and public health um, and various um, programmes that just didn't exist um, when NICE first came in. Um, and I guess if any of you have questions about any of those programmes, I know really well have to refer you to your um, our estimable, estimable website because um, the day when I could confidently talk about everything NICE does is, is quite quite some time ago. Um, but yes, I'm from the Technology Appraisers Programme, which is, I guess, the programme most people are familiar with because it's the oldest one. Um, and we, uh, um, as David said, make decisions on cost effectiveness. And, and we do try to be um, as transparent as we can be. Um, much of the evidence, is, uh, insofar as it can be, is published on our website, all the evidence that supported the appraisal. Um, we do accept confidential information from manufacturers sometimes, um, but we discourage it and we try and negotiate as much of it into the public domain as we can. Um, also, the committee meetings are now held in public and have been for some time now. Um, there is a, a confidential part where the actual decision is made, but again, we do try and hold as much of that discussion in public as possible. Um, and yes, I mean, I guess it is quite difficult. We try to explain the decision as well as we can in the documentation that comes out, but obviously we only have words to do that with, and it's you know, very often difficult to capture the whole discussion um, without writing a whole book. Um, so, um, you know, I, I, I guess, I think, the way the process has changed over the years, it probably has become more transparent. Um, as, I, as I said, we now have as much of the meeting as we can in public. Um, when I first started, the whole meeting was entirely in private. Um, we now also have the manufacturer response of the product in attendance to answer questions. Um, and that happened after we went public because what happened was that the manufacturer um, came and watched the meeting and when the committee raised questions <laughs> they were very frustrated that they, they couldn't answer them. Um, so, so now we have the manufacturers present at the meeting um, for the purpose of answering the committee's questions about their, their, um, their submissions. Um, I was going to say a few words about what's happening at the moment and what's um, happening in the future, what's on the horizon. Um, I mean, at the moment, NICE is pretty much business as usual. Obviously, we have our usual difficulties with some um, very high-cost interventions that are coming along. Um, but a lot, a lot of that is addressed through patient access schemes, and we find they're often needed these days to uh, facilitate access. Um, Value-based assessment. Um, we currently have a consultation on, the, uh, on our website, which closes at the end of next week. Um, so if any of you would like to make any comments about that, um, the opportunity is there to do it. I, I, I think it's quite difficult for me to say anything about it because I don't ultimately know um, what the outcome of that consultation is going to be until it closes. Um, and I also was going to say a few words about our challenges for the future. I mean, NICE is you know, currently quite used to making decisions under uncertainty. Um, we often don't have the um, evidence the complete evidence we would like 
to get a really robust estimate of cost effectiveness. Um, possibly because a lot of the trials that are done have done for an entirely different purpose, which is to um, get a multi authorization. Um, but I think in the future we might find ourselves in even more difficulty with that um, as we get things like adaptive licensing um, coming into play, where we might have to look at things at an even earlier stage um, in their, their life cycle than we do now. Now we might have to uh, think about how we, how we address um, that challenge. I mean, at the moment we do have the option of um, recommending that something's used only in the context of research. But it's not an option that's often used because we don't have funding to conduct that research. And unless there is research ongoing that we know patients can enter, um, it's very difficult to make that recommendation. That does optimised recommendations. That, but, but an optimised recommendation is when we recommend, we recommend <coughs> something not for the whole marketing authorisation population, but for some subset of that. So, yes, it may, it may be that, that it's not cost effective. Um, versus something else across the board, but maybe for some people, they, they benefit more. So, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. James. Thank you, Andy. Uh, three minutes, three points. Um, first of all, value based pricing is dead. Uh, second one, NICE doesn't save money. Third one, PPRS does. <coughs> Price cuts, <coughs> budget caps. Um, uh, a couple of things on each of those, uh, happy to pick up the detail in questions. Um, uh, the first one I won't spend much time on, I um, have talked about this before, I've written a lot of blogs uh, about it. Um, but basically, uh, Andrew Lansley's idea about value-based pricing, which I think derived from Michael Porter's value uh, approach to healthcare, um, has been reduced, uh, it first passed to NICE after the department couldn't carry it forward into an implementation way. And NICE is consulting uh, on the use of quality shortfall and proportional quality shortfall uh, as a measure of value. And uh, they'd like reviews on that by the end of the next week and the answers are uh, presented as yes or no questions in consultation. Um, uh, which, uh, get your mind around what they are, is a big thing, let alone whether they meet the objectives. Um, I, I think it's dead. Um, it, it's gone to, you know, some place in the sky that... Um, um, the home for bereaved policy ideas. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's, that's pretty good, yeah, yeah, yeah. So the second one, um, does NICE save money? Here I'm talking about NICE uh, technology appraisals. Um, and it says no occasionally, like there's a, on the NICE website it has it um, as saying um, no here in, I think it's uh, not recommended 15% of 500 technologies it's praised. So I've, I've gone through those in some detail. The only, I can only find 11 that have uh, continued to be rejected uh, because many of them were accepted later. Uh, lower prices? Uh, sometimes, not only more recently, because the PAS schemes only came in in 2009. Right. But many of them became uh, incorporated into uh, guidelines, were reviewed again, comparisons. Um, so I, I can only find 11, and the savings are minuscule. Yeah. Uh, so instead of 15% refused or not recommended, it's something like 2%. And I should say this is a nice fault. And, um, uh, particularly, it, it, it's to do with the political unacceptability of saying no. It's to do with the, the drugs for multiple sclerosis, for which a special scheme was set up under the guise of being a research project. A costly but, failure. A costly failure, a costly failure, yes, yes. Um, the Cancer Drugs Fund, another uh, fund. And, and I think what's happening is really quite interesting. We're setting up funds for diseases or technologies that uh, we, are, we collectively are unable to say no to some new drug. So I think we have a CF a drugs fund for Ivacaftor, and I think we're about to get a hepatitis C a drugs fund for Sophos Bufir uh, coming up shortly. And it will join the end of life drugs fund and, uh, and a few others. And there's some, something really kind of interesting about that. But my headline on uh, NICE, and this is particularly in the context of austerity and, and the, the interesting discussions this morning, um, cost effectiveness of individual drugs or devices will not save money, uh, if particularly if those are drugs or devices that save lives and uh, are impossible to refuse when it comes to a named patient basis. Uh, and then what, what really, the third point, uh, well, what can save money? 
The only thing that has saved money uh, in the drugs budget in the last 10 years has been the PPRS. And it's not just the capping of the PPRS in the 2014 PPRS, the Pharmaceutical Price Regulation Scheme, for those of you who don't have the acronym. Um, it, it has long had price cuts. And those price cuts have typically been of the order of 2 or 3 or 4%, the highest of them, 7%. So I've gone back and pulled those out. And I think over the same peri the period of NICE's existence, NICE could have saved about 4 billion. It saved only a tiny less than a billion, uh, much less than a billion, because the cost of these other schemes uh, accumulated to, I think it's three and a half billion, something like that. Whereas the PPRS, by imposing price cuts over the same period, saved about four billion. Four billion is peanuts in the context of, well, it's a 10 billion uh, budget for drugs per annum. Four billion over 10 years isn't a lot, but it's, it's, it's a bit. Yeah. Um, and, and the bit I'm, the, 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 the implications of that I'm still trying to figure out. Uh, it does make sense that cross the board price cuts work. Uh, they're being used with the tariff yeah. in terms of funding hospitals. Of um, NICE, NICE is now a key player in setting the tariff. True. <clears throat> uh, and what, one person I talked to about this said, ah, this is, we should have stuck with the accountants instead of bringing the economists into this. <laughs> <laughs> and that, that did stop me in my tracks. But he had a point, you know, that the, economy, that the accountants approach, and I remember this well from working in the health service, it was uh, top slice the budget. Just take a chunk of it away and hang the hindmost. Um, and in the context uh, of reduced uh, NHS funding, I think that's what we're going to see more of. The Sorry. <laughs> the future is top slice. <laughs> Fascinating and a very useful set of set of introductions to the to, to the discussion. Um, a few things, I, I guess, relatively quickly. Um, Value-based pricing is, is is dead and buried, or is this a policy zombie that as we, as we as we sort of chunter on through the the, the, the I, economic I, wasteland? I think it's a limbo. You know, I was from a Catholic, and it was heaven, hell, and yeah. limbo. Limbo was for the good people that didn't get baptized. Um, I think that's where value-based pricing is limbo. Uh, but I think the Catholic Church has moved on from limbo. So <laughs> Well, we, should ask, we should ask Pope Francis to speak ex cathedra on value-based price. Value um, what, what do we think kills value-based pricing? Was it the fact that it's simply a very complex thing to do? I mean, you know, you can argue, obviously, that NICE is a means of value-based pricing. There, there, is a, there is a perfectly coherent argument that actually says what NICE does is value-based pricing. Let, 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 let me try, uh, I agree with that first. I think cost per quality is a form of value-based pricing. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's pretty crude form, but it's a form of value-based pricing. And the tweaking that is suggested is about tweaking the quality. We know what, we know what quality is, quality adjusted life is, yeah. Okay. So, so um, the, the, I, I think what killed it with the way the department's suggestions were going was there were going to be as many losers as well. <coughs> So some technology, some drugs, uh, by taking into account their wider effects on carers and on employment, would save, but some would not. Keeping alive somebody who was in a, a very severely uh, ill state uh, for an extra few months, as is often the case with very severely ill cancer patients, actually would work against the prices of those drugs. And I think once it became clear that value-based pricing wasn't going to be a way of uh, making the, the cost per quality threshold higher, yeah. um, it was a problem. And uh, that's, did, did that right specifically to sort of third-line chemotherapy, or was it there a broader remit where it was going to? Well, I think some of the, some of the most interesting discussions were when people realised that it would, when companies realised that it could work against their products rather than for it. Because up to then, it value, values were going to sort of be magic, and uh, you know, by extending the value proposition, uh, the NHS would pay more. Um, but uh, it cuts both ways, as men, uh, virtually all of these things do. I mean, would, 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 how much of that do you th 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 does the panel think related to the fact that it's actually very difficult to take costs out of the NHS? It's very difficult to completely stop doing things close the ward, sack all the nurses, knock down that bit of the building and sell, sell it off to a property developer to build flats on because that's, that's effectively the only way in which you release serious cost. Dave? Well, if you were relating that to, to NICE's decisions, uh, if, you, if you actually ask 
And if you try and find out what what the what the um, the response of of, uh, of the NHS, uh, whoever they are, um, to to nice, they will say, well, we we absorb it. You know, it is there in our contingency. We don't really know. We don't make any cuts on the basis of anything that nice does. It's just one of those things which is, as James said, it's a, it's a top slicing. So um, I think that that, that that question, you know, answering that question about you know, can you take cost out of the NHS is not, they, they do, as James said again, the accountants know how to do that. Um, and, and they are successful. Whether they do it, do it well is a different matter. Whether they do it at, at minimum, um, you know, uh, minimum reduction in, in harm is a different, completely different. Um, I think the other element of cost now, the other thing about value-based pricing is that it's not just um, requiring extra data, it's not just, I think, extending what we mean by value. But the way that it was always discussed is if you're talking about an individual price for a product, uh, whatever it is, you're into much more of a negotiation um, and, uh, and an involvement with how does the industry you know, set its prices. Um, which is the kind of thing which NICE has, you know, does, a, does a, a bit of, but isn't really, I mean, it's not set up as a negotiated body in that way. So that's, that's the tricky, I think it's the negotiation element that is, is a, a, at least as important as the what does value mean. James, it, it, it's the sense within NICE that, that value-based pricing is indeed, you know, a, a dead parrot. Well, I mean, we have now morphed into value-based assessment, but... Yeah, I mean, I agree. I mean, it'd be, I guess we always did want to assess the value of a product in terms of looking at its cost effectiveness. Um, and value-based pricing seems to just extend the perspective of that into bringing in other, other things, which, um, you know, it, it's a perfectly arguable thing to do, but it doesn't necessarily mean that we pay more for something. Um, and I guess if we're paying health service money, I guess that's what we, we need to think about what the health service is going to disinfect, invest in. And I have to agree, we don't really know um, what is dropped mm. when, when NICE recommends something and the budget has to go to that. I expect it's often something from the wish list rather than um, actual uh, hospitals being knocked down and flats being built there. I think some of that does go on. Mm, mm, sure. So just to get a, a sense in the room, how many, how many of you have worked on products which have patient access schemes? For the NHS. Okay, that's a, that, that's a decent number. Of those of you who put your hands up, my colleagues who have the microphone are going to come around. Please keep your hands up for a second because I'd like to get some reflections from the floor on the experience of, of the practical reality of how it's worked out when you've been trying to have conversations with the NHS to, to achieve patient access schemes. How's that worked? If you can just stick and keep your hand up so my colleagues with the microphones can bring them over to you, because I think it would be useful to get some of those perspectives. Gentlemen, there. Um, two, two things, really. From One, that it was complicated. It took us a while to get our heads around it. It took a while to engage. We needed some professional help, so on and so forth. Also, it's not delivered. Getting onto the listing hasn't delivered the benefits that we expected. We simply haven't actually sold what we thought we'd sell for the investment of time, money, and effort. Interesting. I have a similar, similar um, thought. What seems to have happened is that when the first ones came through, they were solving a problem, which was probably as much a political problem as anything else. It's a question of you know rationing of. of uh, products being denied to populations. As the number of access schemes has increased, now what we seem to be seeing is that particularly hospital pharmacists almost com you know, complain about the complexity, the number of schemes and so forth, and almost accuse the industry of having created these as a sneaky way to get their products used. So the dynamic has changed somewhat in that time. Okay, there's a gentleman on the table in the middle as well, there he has his hand up. Um, is, 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 is your sense that the, I mean obviously, this, this has allowed you to get more in vivo data, you know, in, in a real patient population. Is your sense that that has been able to feed in any way back into your arguments for the value of your product? Sorry, that I was trying to raise my hand. Um, 
Yeah. No, 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 that's, that, that, that's just fine. Sorry, I just wanted to come back specifically to the, the gentleman who asked the previous questions. There hasn't really been a, a, a feeling back in. I think what's happened is it's more, you know, there's a hurdle to overcome, which is actually getting through nice. Yep. There's a mechanism which actually achieved that, and then that's the status quo. Um, and then the real complications that are coming now are that new products coming into the same category area are needing to compare using confidential pricing data. Yep. And that confidential pricing data um, has the potential to leak elsewhere in the world and influence prices there. So yeah. that's where the industry complexity is coming now. Things yeah. which were confidential to the UK are now in danger of leaking and not through NICE, but um, I'm, I'm aware of examples where other countries in Europe have said they know about confidential discounts and trying to base their pricing on a confidential discount. And of course the, the, the discount won't be the same everywhere, will it? No, they, they're specifically relating to the UK example. So where there is an agreed arrangement in terms of value-based open or value of the pricing arrangement, they are saying we're not going to take the reference price from the UK yep. as published. We believe there is X percent discount, and that's the one we're going to use. Because of patient access schemes. Yes. If we can take Mike back over to the to, to the gentleman there, and then once we've heard that comment, we'll come across to the, the panel to get their thoughts. So, uh, in a couple of different market access roles in the field, so I've worked on uh, risk sharing schemes and outcomes based schemes, which are an absolute nightmare for both the industry, I believe, and also for the NHS to make sure that they're both proving the true value of those schemes. Yep. Um, but we, you know, felt that that was the right way to go to make sure that there was access to these medicines for the NHS. Um, and lately, a lot of uh, the access schemes seem to be more about just the straight redu reduction in price due to the fact that the NHS will not pick up the burden of administration um, around these schemes, which I think is a bit of a shame because um, if we could work a way in which we could only say to the NHS, for example, if, you, um, if the outcomes were achieved using these drugs that we could work with you on, then you should pay the price. And when it doesn't, then maybe we should pick up the bill. In principle, I like that idea of the scheme, but it'd um, be interesting to hear the thoughts of whether or not something like that might come back to the negotiation table over the next few years. Dave, what do you think? Well, will, will that kind of thing come back? Well, um, I think we're, because it's been been tried, and, and I, I don't think I don't think there are any good. I mean, I'm, I haven't heard any um, good examples, so uh, I think it would be um, a question of whether you can devise patient access schemes which are which are effective. And uh, again, that's the sort of thing which you can do, I guess, by experimenting, because they uh, the kind of schemes we've experimented with before have not, have not as, as, as everybody's saying, been, been been a success. So I think it's about actually it wouldn't be about getting back and devising. Um, re rethinking, devising exactly what it means by a patient access scheme, and and uh, and if you're going to share, that's an interesting point. I hadn't thought about, of course, that uh, once you start to share these things, you've got to share everything, including the costs of, uh, as you say, of, of making them work. Um, it's a bit difficult though to disentangle. I don't know if you found this, but obviously with the uh, with the reforms and the chaos, um, perhaps it's been a bad time to, to, to try these things out, um, and who knows? So I wouldn't be too too pessimistic. Yes, I mean, I mean we're, I agree with, we've moved more now to the, the straightforward discount type of scheme, simply because of the difficulties there have been um, with the earlier schemes in, instead of, um, in terms of administrative burden, and we now have a panel or people from the NHS and experts who, who actually think about that administrative burden um, and consequently they are somewhat reluctant to, to um, accept very complicated um, schemes. So a lot of those more complicated ones are from the early days, um, but, but they've, they've obviously persisted um, for the, the, you know, the, the, the persistence of the um, guidance is there, I, I guess. Um, I, 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 it would be interested to hear whether, whether actually any more useful data has come out of those schemes. Um, but I, I, I wouldn't uh, necessarily rule them out coming back altogether. I mean, I, I, I think if somebody could 
devise a scheme that was, was useful, you know, maybe um, along the lines of what's being done with intervention or procedures, you know, the, the sort of um, commissioning through evaluation type of model. Um, that might, you know, that might work in the future. And that would be something which, which perhaps the industry could pilot, pilot with the service, do you think? Uh, Possibly, I mean, I'm, I'm speculating. Yeah, it's not But yes, I mean, I would, I would like to rule, rule, rule the more um, elaborate schemes out, especially if, if we could get some um, useful data out of them. Mm. I mean, James, your, your, your evaluation of the beta and spheral um, patient access scheme. Uh, which you, you, you know, you, you really left people in a lot of uncertainty with the title, uh, a costly failure. Um, what's, what's the, um, what's the main flaw? Because I, I, as a colleague down there said, the idea is relatively attractive. <clears throat> the reality of implementing it appears to be very difficult. What? I, I, I think that is the issue. Um, the prospectively measuring outcomes is difficult. But the real problem was what to compare it to. What would have happened if the patients hadn't had the drug? And the problem with the MS risk sharing scheme was they chose a historical cohort of patients from Canada of 20, 30 years ago. And uh, the patients who got the drugs performed less well than this cohort had done. Oh dear. Uh, I, it was a disaster. But I, I, I've. A few quick things about the patient access schemes. Up, up till the end of uh, last year, there were 36 on the NICE website. There were split 18 18 uh, between cancer and non cancer. The cancer ones saved relatively little because many of them went to the drug, cancer drugs fund instead, but the, the, some did. And where they did save was where there was a substitute that was deemed to have equal effectiveness and a different cost. And in that case, if it was a more expensive drug, it had to come down to the cost of the existing <coughs> uh, If there wasn't an, uh, an alternative, they tended to go to the Cancer Drugs Fund. Hasn't that happened with Lucentis and Avastin? Yeah, well, uh, it, 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 has, uh, it has with Lucentis uh, for diabetic edema. And uh, there, there was a, a, a price reduction there, and it was probably the most successful patient access scheme, I think, in terms of saving. But what, what I was struck by when I looked at the non-cancer ones, and that was one of them, is um, some diseases uh, cover a lot of the schemes. So rheumatoid arthritis covers, I think, four or five patient access schemes. More if you look at revisions. And what has happened there is an interface between the clinical guideline and the individual technologies. Uh, and NICE has produced a uh, clinical guideline on rheumatoid arthritis, and it's a stepped progression through these fairly expensive drugs. And, and that seems to have worked quite well, and what they have done is required the new entrants to reduce their price to the existing biologicals. And, and that price is quite open, it's 9.3k per person per year, um, it's, it, it comes up endlessly, and NICE has said, a new entrants, unless you can prove you're better, it's that's the price you get. And there's no commitment that the, the sales will be proportionate. It depends then on the, the sales force to, and whatever the particular patient types and so on. But it, it, that does seem to me that it's almost moving towards a, another fund for rheumatoid arthritis, yeah. which has a clinical guideline, which has probably changed the way patients with rheumatoid arthritis are, are treated, because a lot of them, and these yeah. are expensive drugs. Um, so, so I, I see something really quite interesting there, where the patient access schemes interface with clinical guidelines yeah. and patient pathways, which is also part of NICE's developing remit. So, by the sound of that development, we're almost teetering towards something which, which um, Professor Alan Maynard, a prominent health economist, <coughs> has, 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 has joked about, but I'm not sure he's entirely joking, which is, give NICE a budget. Give NICE a budget to buy all the drugs. Um, what, what, what do you think are the main advantages and disadvantages of that sort of strategy? Well, give the PPRS people, like NICE, PPRS is run by 8.5 people. Uh, NICE has um, 85 uh, plus um, just in the secretariat, let alone all the committees. In terms of cost effectiveness of NICE uh, versus PPRS, um, I give the budget to the PPRS people. <laughs> <laughs> Exactly, they could grow. They could metastasize. They could metastasize. Janet, what would what would? But it is right. Eight point five people. 
you know, how do you get the point five for a person? Half time. Do you think there could be any future for nice to hold a budget in a economically constrained NHS? Well, I mean, that people would like us to do that. I mean, I, I guess people centralised blame. Yes, what, what some people call the threshold. I don't like that word, but uh, uh, we, we leave that aside. It, we, it's meant to be some sort of proxy for what's displaced. If we had to actually decide what's displaced ourselves, it would make that decision um, more transparent um, and more pointed. And more pointed, yes. Um, so yes, I mean that that, that would be. Um, even more tricky decisions than we have already. But I guess tricky decisions are our business. <laughs> I don't like, like, yeah. Setting the tariff. <laughs> Technology approach was guidelines, Dave. Yeah. Well, there's, there's a tricky element to that because what do you mean by give nice a budget or the budget? A budget for what? I mean, are we going to ring fence a drugs budget? and give NICE the responsibility. Is it going to ring fence then include uh, medical technology? And is it going to include public health? And then what, no, how, how do you actually decide how big, say, the drugs of budget should be? So the logic of that is um, for NICE to be taking decisions about everything that the NHS does. Um, local stuff is all about maybe quality of delivery. Um, NICE is there and it looks at everything and says everything we should have. It's a sort of an Oregon type of, uh, of scheme whereby um, you determine what uh, the NHS provides. Now that um, is a big step from what NICE is doing at the moment um, and I think it would be a very interesting thing to do but whether it's plausible um, is, is I, I think Needs, needs some extra thought. But yeah, it's, it's rampant. What, what is it? And if, you, if you're saying that, well, um, the NHS, of course, takes money out of, uh, out of other uh, public services. So are you going to set up a, an uber nice that looks at uh, you know, the difference between the health budget and the education budget and uh, transport and, and yeah, so. Um, I'm not, I, I, th I think there is that, it is a nice idea to be able to take away from PCT, uh, sorry, not PCT, <coughs> I've gone into some it's time here. Yeah. Um, it's gone desperate. Yeah, CCGs and, uh, and, uh, and uh, hospital trusts about what the, what, the, um, what they should actually provide as opposed to being concentrating on issues of quality and delivery. Um, but, is it, is it really So of course the challenge might be that it stifles innovation. Well, uh, if, you, if you were to suggest that um, NICE had a, one of its goals to promote innovation, which I believe it does, um, then uh, if it took that seriously, then no, that wouldn't be a, that wouldn't, wouldn't be a problem. That would even be acceptable. Okay, that's great. Um, one of the conversations which has been had at previous um, iterations of this conference is, um, is about the ability to have meaningful conversations about the value of products. Now, how many of you in this room would like raise your hands if you think you regularly have meaningful conversations with your customers about the value of your product, not the price, the value? That's very, very sketchy. So, 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 so you tell us, well, colleagues, and you'll bring the roving mics around, stick your hand up and tell us why you think it's difficult to have conversations with your customers about value. What, what are the main impediments? Hi, my name is Dr. Karen Jackson, I work for SCA, Hygiene. Um, the main barriers for us are that uh, because our products span a wide range of ages and conditions, um, when we're talking to individuals, when we're talking to procurement, um, they don't see value, they only see the cost of the product um, and if we're trying to talk about well if you buy this product there'll be a knock-on effect on tissue viability for instance in the trust then procurement aren't interested because tissue viability doesn't fall within their budget and if, and if we say you'll have a knock-on effect on your clinical waste they're not interested mm -hmm. because it doesn't come out of their budget yeah. and so trying to talk about cost effectiveness <coughs> yeah. and, and value um, it, it just 
you'd have to speak to a panel of people to get them all talking to one another to, to say, yes, this, this is the right thing to do for this trust or for this CCG. But they, they're all speaking at cross purposes. Right. That, that's our main problem. And there's another lady just over there. Thank you. Lindsay Dovich from Shire. Um, exactly the same situation, very much silo budgets and silo thinking. I think that has been a bit of a transformation in the past couple of years. Um, people's willingness to look slightly more broadly, but they're still very constrained by the individual budgets. And you know, even if you can put a value proposition that will prove, even with a nice technology appraisal in our circumstances, that you can demonstrate what they can actually save by keeping people out of hospital, etc. Still, if they have to find the money in their drugs budget, it's a real challenge. And uh, is, is everybody's experience of, uh, along those lines of any varieties? Has anybody had kind of wildly different experiences? Has anybody had a good call up call? Uh, <laughs> Excellent. Hi, James Stanley from Active Healthcare. Um, I've uh, had some positive experiences actually, but it's required very, very strong leadership. And if you're prepared to take a leadership position across a CCG, a provider unit, um, and private sector, and put people around the table, which by the way is really difficult to do, yeah. but if you can achieve that, the results can be fantastic. Oh, that's, a, that's very heartening to hear. And there's a gentleman just, just, just there, he's also got his, got his own. Hello, my name's Ida Lomo, I'm from Leo Farmer. Um, the point I wanted to make, and this has come, this has come over time that I've worked in different, in different companies, is I've had worked on several sort of areas where a certain drug is quite clearly the gold standard in that therapy area, but obviously there's, there's a cost issue. Now, what I've never understood is when the guidelines have been done for a specific drug, if you can see a real value in, in that pro product actually clinically, but you think, Okay, the cost of this is prohibitive. I've never been, I've never worked for a company where actually nice have contacted the company and said, look, if you were to make your drug more affordable, okay, we were quite happy to, to make, make it so this product is, you know, has, has, has got a better um, placement in the guidelines. Mm. But I don't think, I've, I haven't actually been in a company where that conversation is had. And usually what happens is they'll, uh, the company usually finds out what the placing is and the, what the guidance is going to be after the work has been done. And I'm sure that a lot of companies would, would, would probably say, okay, maybe we can come around the table for this. If you truly believe this is a gold standard and you would prefer this fits the standard of innovation, fits, fits ticks the boxes of um, reduces wastage, improves compliance, improves the results, then let's go around the table and let's try and make this a better, you know, a better deal yeah. so that it, we certainly don't find you don't find the product ends up fourth line or fifth line down the down the scale, yeah. and the patient um, ends up losing out. Yeah. So so Janet, they're ready to negotiate. Apparently. Um, well, yeah. <coughs> I guess we're talking about the guidelines here, yeah. which is uh, you know another um, programming nice, which does consider cost effectiveness, but not um, by the same mechanism that we do, in that we're based on company submissions and. <coughs> the company are telling us the price. Um, we, we don't get into those negotiations because that's, that's not our role. But obviously, if you want to get into those negotiations with the Department of Health um, and bring it in um, under the patient access scheme, then, then that, that can be done. But I think in a clinical guideline, that's different. They, they, they have to go on the, on the list price that's published, and I don't think, see that they have... Um, an alternative to having a guideline patient access scheme. Right. With, if, see, the point I was going to, I'm making is, is that obviously, see, they make, it kind of almost in some respects is one of my big frustrations with sometimes with the industry is we do this negotiation with the NHS, we get a price from the NHS, they agree and say that's fine that price, and then a bit further down the line, you get guidance that comes out and says it's too expensive. Well, if it was too expensive in the first place, why was that price agreed? Because you go for a massive discount? Not necessarily. It's, it's, it's usually the price is the NHS list price. I'm not talking about you know, I'm not talking about cancer, I'm talking about normal just normal, you know, run the mill. Right. 
So it's in that case, if they're saying two years down the line, three years down the line, this product's more too expensive now, well, what's stopping them to go for this? Coming to the table, no, so I, maybe I, 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 I think it's a good point. I've, I've been struck that with a number of uh, patient access schemes recently, NICE has first said no on exactly the way you're saying, you know, just no. And then uh, the company uh, asked for a rapid review, uh, came back with a, 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 a discount, and a new cost-effectiveness model, and the drug was accepted. So, the, but it's a very cumbersome way of doing it. You know, it's well, yeah, cost. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Uh, and I suppose the the the, the, the obvious way to short circuit it is uh, do the modelling first, see what the cost of quality is. Uh, if it comes out at an outrageous level, uh, rather than go through and being rejected by Nice, uh, consider what the price reduction would need to be to make it acceptable, either in terms of cost for quality or of wherever the relevant comparators are. Choosing the comparator is a key thing, of course, as well. So I think we're doing, we're moving a bit towards it, but, but in a rather clumsy way. So we've got to, we've got to learn how to haggle more gracefully and swiftly. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> also, just give a different perspective on this. In, in most other countries, the haggling goes on prior to the product being available. So a product's gone to license, then there's an, a protracted negotiation with uh, another regulatory body about what's an acceptable price. So I'm aware of some products which have taken, normally it's about a year before, after the license fully got on the market. In some cases, it can be several years. Yeah. In the UK, we have this process where the Department of Health doesn't really negotiate price, it agrees it, um, and then it's up to the company to try and sell it. But we bring in NICE or SMC or other groups which form some form of um, uh, rationing and rational approach to the market. Yeah. It's just simply that we do ours in a different way from other countries, which is also why we are widely referenced yeah. by about a quarter of the world's market. Yeah, that is interesting. The, um, what are the other issues that people have sent in to us? Um, have we got a technology appraisal system that accurately captures the value of the health gain and the avoided illness? James? <laughs> We've got it as good as anybody else. Uh, cost per quality um, it is a pretty good attempt at it. I think the, the weakness, perhaps, on the cost per quality uh, is its sensitivity to patient preferences as opposed to population preferences, because what it's what the, the values it's reflecting are those of the population, not of the individual. And there's some really tricky issues there because when you ask the quality of life of somebody who's very severely disabled, often they say it's very good. Yeah. Whereas from a, a social perspective, people say no, it's very poor. So there are very tricky issues about when uh, the patient input is more important. So I think there's, a, uh, th there's an interesting tension there. And, and I, I think that's probably where the value really does come in. And I think that's where some of those cases where special funds have been set up. Because um, patients saying the value, for instance, in uh, cystic fibrosis of improved breathing yeah. is, is, is seen as very considerable. Uh, <laughs> and I can perfectly understand that about a kid who was, you know, coughing themselves to death, and a belief that by improving the breathing, that they might live longer. Um, so, capturing that, uh, that may be part of the reason that the cost per quality for uh, Ivacaftor was, was primitive. And yet, uh, all of the nice type agencies who dealt with it uh, were overruled by the minister who said, fund it. And uh, it didn't happen to NICE, uh, it went through specialised commissioning and so the funding. So I think there are some really difficult and interesting case studies about how you measure value and how particularly you measure the value to the patient, but also the parents and you know 